perhaps a better uh, result. Um, our next presentation is Patrick Manette, Christianity at the Local Level, an Open-Minded Perspective on Community. All right, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to everyone uh, for coming. So, as the professor said, my talk is Christianity at the Local Level, Open-Minded Perspective on Community. Now, that's basically a long-winded way of saying that I visited a few Vermont churches, and I'm here to basically tell you about those. <laughs> so, uh, first off, because I'm giving a talk uh, on Christianity on religion, I thought it'd be good to say a little bit about myself first so people see where I'm coming from. So, a bit about me. I'm a sophomore, molecular biology and biochemistry major. I came to Middlebury knowing this is what I wanted to do. I can't say I came to Middlebury thinking I'd ever take a class in the religion department. Um, but in typical liberal arts fashion, um, spring semester of my freshman year, I ended up in a class on Islam, really enjoyed it. So in the fall, I took a class, uh, Religion 130, The Christian Tradition, taught by Professor Gibrowski Schaefer in the back, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, so because of that, I decided to pursue the religion minor, and the motivation to do this presentation stemmed out of that. Now, I was born as a Catholic. I was baptized, but nothing after that. Uh, after the birth of my younger brother, we stopped going to church when I was around three or four. So really, I don't consider myself too closely tied to Christianity or Catholicism. So the way I see religion is very much from the way I came into Middlebury, so I see it very much from an academic perspective. So I really like the definition from the Middlebury Religion Department uh, on their home page. An understanding of religion is essential to a true comprehension of human culture, world history, global politics, and international conflict, not to mention the world views of billions of people. And I really like that definition because I think it brings together so much of what the liberal arts is all about, and I thought, this is a great way for me to get that aspect of my education out of the Middlebury experience in contrast to the rest of the hard science, chemistry, biology courses that I was going to be taking while I was here. And it also addresses some of my personal thoughts about religion. I think it's a really nice way to bring communities of people together, both at the local level and internationally. Um, and I also think, um, as Jenna addressed earlier, it's a good way for people to, it promotes those positive values and moral judgments and like I said, as Jenna had brought up, um, just generally creates better people. They're, they're seeking out different, they have different motivations, and I really, uh, as the theme of this, uh, these series of talks are. Uh, so what you'll hear today is stems out of a, my final paper that I wrote for the course, um, where I talked about these observations from the church and then tied it in a little with the history of these different denominations. Um, my main thesis, and this was painful to write because I really felt from my observations that there were other things, but I understood I was looking at very much case studies. Um, but my talk today is mainly going to center not so much on the history of these denominations, but more on the observations I found and the impressions I gained from the various church visits I went on. So I'll start with Roman Catholicism. So this is the religion that a lot of people know they associate with Pope Francis. Um, he is associated with it. Um, and, <laughs> not a misconception. And, and this, this uh, Roman Catholicism traces itself back nearly 2,000 years, uh, all the way back to Jesus Christ. Um, and over the course of many centuries up till now, there's been councils that have been gathered, various reforms, both from these councils of, of priests, but also just societal movements that have shaped it into what it is today. So, what we've also noticed in recent years is a decreasing uh, membership and interest in younger generations. So that's something to keep in mind. So I visited the Church of the Assumption in Middlebury, Vermont. Many of you have driven by this, walked by this. It's on College Street. And I went to a service there. And it was as I imagined. This is where I was going, not this exact church, but to a Catholic church when I was little. And it is how I remembered it. Um, it's got the high ceilings, the stained glass windows, the long pew benches. It felt very much uh, traditional Christianity, my idea of what that was. And the service went through a pretty, what I considered to be a standard uh, set with uh, the prayer, the songs we read from the gospel, uh, sections from the Bible. Uh, and then the Nicene Creed is when everyone at the same time in the audience starts to, to promote this affirmation of their belief in Christ and God and the Holy Spirit. And then the communion, otherwise known as the Eucharist, Eucharist um, is when everyone 
uh, that has been, uh, it's, this was a closed communion, so everyone that had gone through communion was going to accept the bread and the wine, um, the blood, the body of Christ. Um, but I was not allowed to do the communion uh, because I had not gone through those steps. It was the fastest of all the services visit. It had the largest attendance, but interestingly, everyone was very spread out, um, and I didn't feel uh, it to be as very close-knit between the members. My next uh, visit was to a Mormon church, so a little bit of background about the Mormons, founded by Joseph Smith. He was born in Vermont, uh, and, and it's kind of started around upstate New York area, not Utah like a lot of people think. Uh, the Book of Mormon, which is added on to the Bible, was said to be transcribed from a set of gold plates he received a vision about from an angel, so he transcribed the Book of Mormon from those gold plates. Uh, you can see there's a few million, uh, 14 million active members, and there's also a near mandatory, I say near mandatory, it's not required, but it is very frowned upon if you don't do it. It's supposed to be um, a, a true commitment to, to, uh, to Mormonism if you, if you go on these missionary requirements, generally out of high school. So I visited the Joseph Smith Birthplace Memorial in Royalton, Vermont, um, and showed up looking nice. Everyone else there was looking very nice. Uh, the communion at this church was interesting because it was an open communion. If you felt comfortable, you could take it. So they had people going around uh, with, with kind of buckets of uh, mini, uh, mini waters and mini pieces of bread, and they passed them through the crowd, and you could grab some, and then everyone did it together. And I thought that was nice because it made me feel welcome in a, a foreign environment. And Mormonism, we hear a lot about it in the media, and it seems to be very mysterious, but I found this service to be rather accessible. It was similar to the Roman Catholic service, but at the same time, it just felt a little more tight-knit. The room was smaller. Um, it was a little more densely packed as a result. Um, and the people uh, were generally nice. Uh, and as it says up there, uh, it was similar to the Roman Catholic with the benches and everything, but it lacked the crazy decorations, the nice stained glass windows. It was very much a plain, plain room. We also had a chance to visit uh, a museum about Joseph Smith's life. It was the Joseph Smith Birthplace Memorial. Um, and in there, we talked with some tour guides. There was, there was a few missionaries there who I've pictured up there. Uh, the three on the left and the one on the right were uh, missionaries. Uh, most were from, were from Utah. Um, and they, along with some uh, elders in the church gave us a nice tour of the museum, told us a little bit about Joseph Smith's life, and it was all very interesting. But one of the things that kept coming up was this sense of mystery and sacredness that we were not ready to have access to, essentially. There were things that they weren't comfortable telling us, um, <clears throat> which we respected, um, but it was interesting uh, to note that while the service itself felt very uh, felt very comfortable and, from, and, and nice to be in. We felt that there was something that wasn't there. We also heard a speech from a high school senior who was getting to graduate and go on his missionary service. Now, it seemed like this service was, um, the church was almost centered around the speech that this, this uh, person was going to give. And interestingly enough, he goes up there. He doesn't quite have a full speech prepared. And he just starts talking, and you can tell a lot of it's coming from his head. And he started to get this very unsettling sense that he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be a Mormon. He didn't want to have to go on that service um, and spend the next two years of his life doing that. Um, and that was really weird to watch because he's surrounded by these people that are very dedicated. He's surrounded by his family sitting behind him, and then he had to sit next to him for the rest of the service. So that was very interesting to hear. And then finally, the Pentecostal church I visited a little bit here. It was, it's a fairly new uh, denomination found in the early 20th century, Charles Fox Parham. Pictured up there is Amy Semple McPherson, who was one of the key early leaders in the church. They gave these very um, charismatic presentations, um, and Oral Roberts was one for faith healing. There's also some things about speaking in tongues, which a lot of people hear. And also, if you think of people like Joel Olstein. Um, that, this, I would consider Pentecostal to kind of be a grounding for that, uh, that the big uh, Joel Osteen style church is stemmed from. So I visited the Assembly of God Church in Virgins. I made two visits there. And it was nice because it felt really informal. It was a smaller room. The chairs, there were no benches. They were all pull-out chairs that you could sit in. They had a band there, guitars, drums, keyboards, singers. 
And, it, and the songs were very modern. They, some of the copyrights on these songs were 2012, 2013. Catchy songs that I found myself stuck in my head on the way back and over the coming days. Um, there were some Bible readings and analysis, but they really weren't uh, super, um, super religious, super specific. It was generally, here's a piece from the gospel. How can we apply this to our daily life and living as a good Christian? which I really uh, appreciated. And I also felt very welcome there. The people knew I was a new person there. They were very welcoming, but they weren't at all pushy on me, which was nice. So to make some conclusions out of that, the Mormon church surprised me because, you know, in society we hear so much about how odd the Mormons are and, and with Mitt Romney, like, ooh, what's, what's going on back? What is he up to? Um, <laughs> and the student's speech, again, very uncomfortable to hear because there, there's, uh, I would say somewhere around 100 people, maybe slightly less than 100, who are going around uh, just watching him, excited for him, and he's sitting there giving a speech that to me came off as, I don't want to be here right now, and this is the worst thing that's ever happened. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was very uh, uncomfortable. And as I said, they were a little secretive. There were times when we would ask a question, they would say, well, we hold that really sacred to us, um, and that's not something we really talk about. Um, so I'd be curious to learn more, but I feel like that would require a much greater commitment on my part that I'm not quite ready for. <laughs> uh, Roman Catholic, uh, it was the quickest service, but it definitely felt the most traditional and straightforward. Um, but I was surprised that of all the places, the one that I came from, I felt most unfamiliar there. I felt mo most unwelcome there, in a sense, because there was so much that I couldn't do, so much that I, I couldn't participate in. For example, the Nicene Creed, I didn't know off the top of my head how that went. So I was sitting there in silence while everyone else around me was saying this creed. And the Pentecostal turned out, in my opinion, to be my favorite. It's certainly a casual Pentecostal church uh, compared to some other ones. But they were very close-knit. Everyone was free to express their faith in different ways. Some people would sit. Some people would stand. Some people were crying. Some people had their arms up. So it was very, very nice. And the band and electronic equipment, they used PowerPoint for the song lyrics, and during the sermon, there were PowerPoints that showed the different uh, sections from the gospel that we'd be talking about. So all that really helped to make it uh, something that was uh, a very nice environment to, to spend my, my Sunday on. So finally, I'd just like to thank Professor Gaborowski Schaefer for motivating me to do this presentation and for teaching the class the Christian tradition. Uh, Professor Hatch Georgiou, faculty head of Ross Commons, she's another person who came into play for motivating me. Um, the fall Christian tradition class, I'm pictured with some of the members there, and Professor Schaefer, um, they went up with me to a lot of these church visits, and that was a lot of fun. He organized the symposium, they did a lot of hard work, and I just want to recognize them for that. And thank you to all of you for coming to hear me. Thank you. Questions? Yes. I'm wondering what role... Um, biblical text had in these different services and how they use those, the, the Bible. Yeah, so the Catholic Church uh, had some sections from the Bible. Um, I think it was the Gospel of Matthew that we looked specifically at in that service. And it definitely felt that um, a lot of that service was dedicated more towards specifically the Bible and studying out of the Bible and seeing how things from the Bible tie into each other. The Mormon Church we sang a hymn that wasn't in the Bible. Um, and while they do put a lot of emphasis on the Bible, the Book of Mormon is very important to them. They gave me one. Um, and one of the songs uh, that we sang at the Mormon church um, felt like a traditional Christian song, but one of the lyrics at one point, they were just chanting over and over, we are all gods, which seemed kind of odd in Christianity. Um, so that was something uh, that I, made a mental note of. And then the Pentecostal church, the new songs, they are based out of Christian ideals, but they're not referencing specific Bible verses. They're not written that way, necessarily. Um, and then in the service, when we would read out of the Bible, it would generally be a fairly short passage. Uh, and in the two visits I saw, he would go off and, and really take that somewhere that, that was out of the Bible and more in our own lives. Maybe one more question. After break. I'm wondering what other churches you went to, and if you went to any other churches. Um, just like if you could elaborate more. You said these are specific case studies, but I'm wondering 
what the context um, of them is? Like if you choose, chose to admit other churches you went to? Yeah, so, uh, so these were the three that I, that I went to for the project. Um, and that's why I was careful not to draw any sweeping conclusions. And that's why, even though I personally thought the Pentecostal was my favorite one, yeah. and I was talking about how can these churches come together to draw in more members, um, I still think that overall Catholicism just has a lot more going for it. Uh, <laughs> in terms of their level of appeal that, and, and the amount of people they can reach. So there's certainly, you can visit tons of churches, dozens to, to start getting a, a, a better idea, and not just out of the mom. Um, so there's a lot of things that you could do with that, and that's something in the future to maybe look more into. 